The entire 19th century, there's eight worldwide published papers on heart attack, eight. 1912, John Herrick publishes the first known case of myocardial infarction heart attack in the United States with documented autopsy evidence. By 2010, 32% of deaths in the U.S. due to coronary heart disease, cancer. 1900, it's rising, 5.8% of deaths, that's 1 in 17. 2010, 31.1% of deaths. Type 2 diabetes, 1935, it's rising, 0.37%. Notice it continues to rise up to 2015, we're at 9.4%. Obesity, it rises. By 1960, we're at 13%. 1988, 23%. 2015, 39.8%. So what about processed food during this time? So we know from 1822 to 1999, sugar consumption was rising. It went up 17-fold, nutrient-deficient food, right? We got roller mill technology, which created refined white wheat flour, a nutrient-deficient nutrient food, in 1880. 1911, Procter & Gamble introduces Crisco, trans fats. So that's our four processed foods right there. Put those together and you've got processed food. Weston Price recognizes all this in his epic research uh, and his treatise, uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, publishes this, connecting these four foods, essentially, to what became diseases of civilization. Nobody listened. 2009, our own USDA shows 63% of the American diet is made up of these four processed foods and diseases of civilization look something like this, right? They're through the roof. Total vegetable oil consumption. You can see from the 1860s up until about 1909, we're around two grams a day. Steadily rises then with, with the introduction of all the other vegetable oils uh, up to 80 grams a day by 2010. So we went from zero to 80 grams of vegetable oil a day in 145 years. This is an infinite increase in these. We didn't have them before. 80 grams a day of oil, that's 720 calories, that's 32% of U.S. caloric intake. That makes this the single greatest change to nutrition in all of history. 1900, 99% of our added fats came from animal fat. 2005, 86% of added fats came from vegetable oils. So the vegetable oils almost completely uh, supplanted uh, animal fats, lard, butter, and beef tallow. So these omega-6s, they accumulate in our fat tissue. And this is a study from Stephen Guiné put together. He compiled 37 studies that looked at linoleic acid, uh, the omega-6, in our adipose tissue, in human adipose tissue from 1959 to 2008. Look where it was in 1959, 9.1%. Look where we ended up in 2008, 21.5%. When we consume linoleic acid, we tend to accumulate it. We just can't burn all these for fuel. All right, so here's what we should be eating. This is from Speth and Spielman in 1983. These are wild ungulates, wild hooved animals, and look at their linoleic acid consumption. If you can see it there, I've highlighted in the green. Um, it ranges from trace to 3.85% with an average linoleic acid of 2%. So this is the sort of level of linoleic acid we should be getting in our diet, around 2%. Um, don't believe it? Here's grass-fed beef, 2.01% and 3.41%. So this is where we should be getting our linoleic acid primarily, our omega-6. But instead, here's what the fats look like today. So now the top four on this list, coconut oil, butter, palm, and lard, these are great fats. All the red is the saturated fat. That's what we want. All the blue is the omega-6. And if you look from cottonseed oil down, that's all the uh, vegetable oils that have been added since 1866-ish. Transplant yourself back to 1865 and for all of history prior, this is what we would have gotten. So we would have gotten butter, lard, and beef tallow. This would have been our sources of omega-6 and their approximate amount, concentration, based on uh, grass-fed animals. So butter, about 3%. Lard and beef tallow, about 2%. So that's what, we, that's what we should be getting. Here's what we're getting today. Look at all the blue. And here's what we should be getting. So what did this do to us? 1999, we're at 18 grams a day, all right? Now I went back and calculated what we should be getting in 1865 had we been consuming um, a typical diet then. 2,000 calories, 40% of it coming from pastured animal fat, 2.5% of that coming from linoleic acid, which is what we should be getting. And that gives us 2.2 grams of omega-6 
per day, 2.2 grams. So over this period of time, 135 years, this elevated about eight-fold. This is a very interesting study where there's three groups of rats on isochloric diets. So these rats got identical amounts of calories, protein, fat, carbs, and omega-3 fats. One variable, omega-6. All right, three different diets. Beef tallow group, omega-6, 4.4%. Olive oil, omega-6, 7.7%. And a safflower oil group, omega-6, 36.6%. Okay, so here's the table. So you've got the fat source on the left, beef, olive, and safflower oil. Calories, all the same. Fat, it's a high-fat diet, 59%. Look at the omega-6, and I'm going to highlight these. So we get 4.4% in the beef fat, 36.6% in the safflower oil group. Look what it does to their body fat on the far right. 10.3% in the beef fat group, 54.5% in the high PUFA safflower oil group in three weeks. Uh, they all gained weight relative to the beef fat group. The olive oil group, 7.5% more weight. The safflower oil, oil group, 12.3% more than the BFAT group. That's 21 pounds human equivalent. Stefan Guillenay also calculated this. So how is this possible? They all consumed the same calories. They all consumed the same macronutrients. The only difference was the omega-6. So here's the question. How could a high omega-6 PUFA diet induce obesity without increasing calories? And the answer is energy dis dysregulation. And what I mean by that is two very simple concepts. One, energy is stored more efficiently. And two, energy utilization expenditure decreases. When we're gaining weight, getting obese, we have less energy utilization expenditure, and we store it more easily.